I will be talking about geroscience and what the concept of geroscience is. What, why did we come with this concept and what is its importance? So we have, most, most of us have seen this uh, terrible graphic that shows people age below five and people age over 65. And the scary thing is that these two curves overlapped already in 2017, 2018. So for the first time in the history of humanity, we have more old people than young people. This is new for the species. This has never been seen in any species, in fact. And with that comes a big concern, because as we know, diseases, of age, diseases increase as a function of age, so the more age people we have, uh, we're not going to be able to handle this. At the same time, there's another problem that as more people age and retire, they don't working, they're not working, so of course the support for the working, from the working force becomes critical. Now there's only two working people to su uh, support each old person. That's terrible. That's really concern. And the question is, is it really a problem? Is it really the, the main problem that we're thinking of, that's, that we're going to collapse because of these of this, uh, things in here? So I would argue that maybe it's not. Maybe it's an opportunity. Now, let's be clear. It is a major problem. It's a disaster in the making if we don't change the way we address uh, health in the, uh, if we continue doing the way that we did in the 20th century. Now let's make clear, this very increase, high increase in, uh, in the number of aged people is a big success. It's the success story of biomedicine in the 20th century. But now we have to deal with the aftermath, with the other things. The problem is that the way we address health in the 20th century was different type of diseases. We developed vaccines, we developed uh, antibiotics, we developed health programs. All of that worked very well in the 20th century and that's how we got where we are. However, that's not going to work in the 21st century. We're in a different place right now. The diseases are different, we have to address them in a different way. So, the most important thing is that aging is the major risk factor for most chronic diseases. This is a, a sorry, show of cancer. Cancer as a function of age. Notice that the curves are basically identical. These are different cancers in different tissues, driven by different genes, different etiologies altogether. However, they all happen in about when we're about two-thirds two of our lifespan. The same is true in mice. Mice develop in, uh, cancer in less than two years because that's two-thirds of their lifespan. It's true in dogs, it's true in other species too. This is not a coincidence. Aging is the major risk factor for cancer. It's not the accumulation of, of, um, of cells that are uh, mutated. We are all full of those cells but we don't have cancer until we get old. Another example, because this is what people working in cancer say, oh, it takes forever to accumulate all of these mutations, in spite of the fact that mice can do it very efficiently, much better than us. So let's look at another example. This is Alzheimer's, accumulation of a beta plaques in the brain. You see this increase with age. What we don't show you is what happens with the rest of the lifespan. If the issue was just accumulation of damage, which is the usual argument, then you would see a linear accumulation as a function of age. You don't. Even if you're born with the wrong mutations that you're going to get Alzheimer's early, you don't see a linear accumulation. You see this type of curve, it just delay, uh, 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 happens earlier if you have the mutations. So why is this curve like this? You are producing the bad proteins. You are producing the proteins that aggregate all along. But while you're young, you have resilience. You manage those proteins. You do something about them. As you get old, 
you lose that ability to deal with the proteins, and that's when you get the disease. So we're making big strides to understand aging, and that's where the intersection becomes important. So just to give you an, uh, an example of where the problem is. So we ha we're in improving lifespan. During this morning, lifespan will have increased by about an hour. Okay, lifespan worldwide. This is the uh, increase in life expectancy in people over 60 years old during a period of eight years. Okay, this is the increase in life expectancy. The problem is that at the same time we have increase in life expectancy, this is the increase in diseases. We are improving, improving our lifespan, but we are improving, in, increasing the diseases at the same time. Why is that? I think it's because we have taken the wrong approach. We are all born with certain capacities uh, by our genes and environment, um, multiple systems, and eventually, as I mentioned, they start going down at different rates for different people. Okay? And different people die when this system becomes incompatible with life. So in this particular case, this person dies of cardiovascular disease because that's the first system that failed. What does the biomedical community do with this information? Cardiovascular disease, death to cardiovascular disease is killing us. Let's put all of our effort against cardiovascular disease. They don't pay attention to the same person had other problems at the same time. Okay? But those, no, those are not the ones that kill them. Therefore, we don't pay attention to them. So we make su some success in cardiovascular disease, and the person does not die of cardiovascular disease as it was meant to. Well, dies later of maybe dementia, sarcopenia, with cancer, with inflammations, with uh, diabetes, etc., etc. This is what's happening. So we address one disease at a time, and the conditions where the individual has a decline in all functions, not just that one. And that's why we have the increase in diseases. So I think that we need to break the war on disease X. War to cancer, war to Alzheimer's, war... No, 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 no. That's not going to get us anywhere. The reason is very simple. If you look at the incidence of any given disease, coronary artery disease is the one I chose in here, it's only a 3% increase in incidence, not in prevalence, in incidence between 70 and 80%. So it's 3%. However, if you have one disease, no matter which one, the chances that you're going to get a second disease, that one increases by about 20%. That's what aging is. It's an increase in multiple morbidities. The other thing that happens is that I'm, I'm saying, well, aging is the major risk factor. How does it happen? Aging happens in the absence of disease. And that's something, again, we have to know very clearly. I cannot party like I did 30 years ago. I just can't. I, I just get, get tired. <laughs> I have to go to bed. Okay? Our resilience goes down. Even if you're very well trained, this is true for Everybody. This is world records of running 100 meters or whatever. It goes down with age. Our resilience, our ability, don't laugh like that. It's true, I cannot party like before. <laughs> you just didn't know me before. <laughs> okay, so uh, your capacity to resist stresses decreases, no matter what you do. And that's what aging is really about. So we focus a lot on the increase in frailty. In my opinion, frailty is something that happens a little bit too late. By the time you're deemed to be frailty, to be frail, uh, usually it just means that you're going to die soon. There's not much that can be done about it. Resilience, on the other hand, is something that happens much earlier. A 40-year-old is not as resilient as a 30-year-old. So my goal is to measure res develop methods to uh, develop uh, to measure resilience. 
So basically what I'm trying to say is that if we're trying to figure out the, the, uh, how aging leads to disease, we have been putting a lot of effort in frailty. We also had to consider resilience, which is not the opposite side of the coin because resilience happens earlier. In fact, frailty is the downhill, downstream effect of the loss of uh, resilience. So by focusing on resilience, we're going to have a better uh, go at this. So I think we had to rethink the basis. Aging is by itself the major risk factor for chronic diseases and disabilities. And I uh, put the emphasis on disabilities. It's not just diseases. It's disabilities as well. And the corollary is that addressing aging will provide the biggest impact by addressing multiple age-related conditions at the same time. Not one at a time, but all of them together. So let me put it another way. You go to a doctor because you have a problem, and the doctor sees the symptoms and addresses what disease you might have. You either had diabetes or you had dementia. That's what the doctor is looking for. Okay? There are symptoms that characterize diabetes and symptoms that characterize dementia. And the doctor sees that. What happens is that these symptoms that you see are caused by the biology of that disease. Problems with insulin, problems with your capacity to reason, etc. But aging biology is the major risk factor, and it's common to both. Therefore, by focusing on aging biology rather than the biology of the, dis of the specific disease, we're going to be able to tell you what your risk is, not what disease you have. In order to know what disease you have, yes, you have to look at the specific symptoms of the diseases. But your risk is given by how well or bad, oops, how well or bad you're aging. And if we can determine that, we will see if we are aging at the right uh, rate expected, faster, slower, what, what we can do about it. So the important thing is that aging is malleable. And we know that it's malleable. That's why we go on diets. That's why we exercise. Because we know that it's going to help us age better. Okay, So it's malleable. We've always known that. But actually, using some paradigms like uh, calorie restriction, for example, which we know extends lifespan and health span, we have been able to identify multiple, actually about a thousand genes that change with age. Out of those, they fall into certain pathways. There's a handful of pathways that are affected, AMP kinase, tumors, uh, TOR, etc. And because of that, we have now uh, drugs that help with the process of aging. That's new. That's a very exciting development. Now, the important thing is that we measure lifespan, but lifespan is not what we're looking for. It's just that it's easy because it's binary. You're alive or you're dead. It's not a continuous change. Okay? But the important thing is health. And health is improved too. Now, at this point, I usually show a movie, which I just found out it does not work. So I will show you the, the still of the movie, Bas but basically I can tell you what it is. These are 38-month-old mice, very, very old mice, very, very. I mean, they're equivalent of centenarians or beyond, okay? All four of these mice are the same age. These ones are the controls, and they behave as you expect a centenarian to behave. That one has a tumor, this one has terrible fur. Well, some of us don't have her fur, but that's a different story. And they're not moving much. These guys, the same age, have been treated with rapamycin for six months. And rapamycin is something that affects the rate of aging. It's not for a particular disease. It affects the rate of aging. And these mice, if the movie was there, you would see that they're running around, they're exploring, they're rearing, they're uh, looking around, they have beautiful coats, they're looking much healthier. Okay? Yet we have not addressed any of their diseases. We have addressed their rate of aging. 
So, what's the challenge? The challenge that we have is that diseases are often studied se separately. You hear people who study cancer, people who study diabetes, people who study mental disorders. They're each one separate and they don't talk to each other much. And yet, aging is a major risk factor for all of them. And that's where the whole concept of geroscience came around. Can we do studies that explain how the biology of aging affects the biology of disease and how do they interact with each other at the molecular and cellular level? And that's what geroscience is, trying to understand at the molecular and cellular level how come aging biology is the drive, main driver of disease. So, out of this idea comes the so-called geroscience hypothesis, which is if we accept that aging is at the core of all of these and other diseases, then by reducing the rate of aging, we're going to be able to reduce the rate of all of them. Not any one of them, all of them. And it turns out not only the diseases, as I mentioned before, also those conditions that come with aging, such as fatigue, frailty, and cataracts, things. This is a disease, but it's, it's not given enough, enough interest because it doesn't kill us. However, it severely reduces our quality of life. So those things are also going to be affected if we change the rate of aging. So why do we need a new name for this? We focus on death. Unfortunately, we focus on death. We should not focus on death. But that's what biomedicine does. We focus on death, and death is caused by diseases. And now what I'm telling you, diseases are caused by aging. So basically, if you're focusing on treating specific diseases, you're talking about geriatrics. If you focus on preventing the specific diseases, understanding how the diseases develop, you're talking about gerontology. And geroscience actually focuses on delaying the upstream effect of aging so we don't get the diseases and therefore, well, eventually we will die, believe it or not. Uh, we're not going to prevent death. We're going to modify the way we, de we die. We're going to die in better health. You know, a lot that can be discussed on that. So just to finish with just some examples, and there will be some other examples during the, uh, the course of the meeting. So this is with senolytics, which are uh, molecules that have been shown to eliminate a particular type of cell, which is called senescent cells. This is an experiment done in the Campisi lab, where in this case they used a genetic manipulation in the mice to eliminate the cells by treating them with ganzacovir. Uh, what they did, what they, they wanted to see what happens during uh, chemotherapy. One of the things that happens with chemotherapy is that people get extreme fatigue. They don't want to run, they want to walk. They just lay down, okay? So they look at that in, in mice, and what they did was they treat the mice with doxorubicin, and indeed, the activity, is, this is spontaneous activity, uh, during the night, decreased dramatically. But if at the same time that they give the doxorubicin, they also eliminate the senescent cells, the activity is re regained. Okay, the mice are not fatigued now. And actually, it turns out the tumors go down, so it doesn't have a, that immediate side effect, at least. Now, this is genetic, but based on the success of, uh, of some of the genetic manipulations, and Darren will talk about that at some point, I hope, there have been the development of m multiple drugs that act as senolytics, so they can be used without this uh, trick of, uh, of a genetic intervention. So, and it has been tried even in humans. This is a study, uh, a very small study, granted, it's, it was just a phase one clinical trial with senolytics on idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Now remember, we're not addressing the disease, we're addressing senescent cells. Okay, and in this case, the senolytics given to this, actually I think only 14 patients or something. I mean, it's really a very tiny study. That's how you start. Thanks. 
we see a decrease, a, an improvement in physical function. That's statistically significant in all these physical functions. Not an effect on pulmonary fibrosis itself, and that was expected for other reasons that I won't go in, but an improvement in health, in how the individuals feel. Another example, rapamycin, I already mentioned rapamycin. So this is senolytics improving cardiac function in both mice and dogs. So this is the decrease over the time of the experiment in ejection fraction, for example, in mice and in dogs. And in the presence of rapamycin, you get an improvement in ejection fraction, both in mice and in dogs. Interestingly, these are your pet dogs. They're not laboratory dogs. And I'm not going to talk about this one because uh, John will talk about that, uh, hopefully, <laughs> right? This is in humans. Now rapamycin has been tested again, even though rapamycin is supposed to be an immunosuppressive drug, well, it improves your immune response. That's a conundrum, but that's because it's affecting aging. So the bottom line is that we can address indeed the health issues. Yes, we can. And therefore, we can prevent this big, big bad thing that's about to happen to us. And if you think about this is, oops, this is a simplified way of, ah, there, <laughs> of how our life happens. We're born, we train with child, then we produce and consume, then we become frail and we die, right? But we don't all die at the same time. Some people will die early, will become frail early, and we will have to take care of those people always, always, no matter what. However, if our approach works, what we're going to be producing is an increase in this, a change in this side of the curve. We're going to improve the people who are resilient and are well-functioning past their normal uh, was currently known. So this is uh, Mr. Singh running a marathon at 103 years old. Hopefully we're all going to be able to do that. If we're so inclined, I won't run a marathon. So the idea is, okay, we're going to hopefully, in, uh, let me see, reduce the period of frailty, but we're also going to produce this long period in which we're going to have healthy people that are past what's currently the retiring age. Changing the retiring age is politically not very good. But we really can uh, have to do something with these people. We have to teach them to do something. So in summary, aging is by far the major risk factor for most chronic diseases, and it's malleable. And the Gerasonis hypothesis poses that addressing basic biology of aging will result in better health than addressing diseases individually. Yeah.